Ladies and gentlemen and everybody in between, welcome to Overanalyze Adventures, the show where I overanalyze the plot and game design of video games, because I got some free time. After this show, I have 2015's Kickstarter success story, Alum, made by new time developer Crashable Studios, who are a brother team based out of some suburb in Maryland, United States. So is it American-made game? So with that said, let's start up the game, and oh yeah, it's made in AGS, so I'll have a kind of funky 4x3 resolution. Not much I can do about that, I do apologize. So the game starts off with what appears to be a crazy homeless gentleman just yelling into the wind. Unfeigned. Altruist. Move, speak, breathe. Remove the groping veils. How long? Don't let them sleep forever. Well, that was a hell of a cold open. Did any of that make sense to you? Because it certainly did not make sense to me the first time I played through this game. Even now, after playing through it a couple of times, it still seems kind of... whatever. Anyway, what isn't whatever is this game's art style. It's pretty nice. It's a very nice retro pixel art style that's oh so chic right now. Admittedly, some of the character models seem a bit... eh. Honestly, though, for the most part, it's a very solid effort. Also, Alum has some pretty nice music in it. Yeah, it should come as no surprise that the brothers who made this game are also musicians. And for the most part, this game is a competently well-made game from a technical standpoint. There's a few hiccups here and there, but I'll get into that later. Nevertheless, let's get back to the game proper and meet our hero, the titular Alum. Yeah, I don't know if Alum's a reference to something. I did Google it and find out it's some sort of rock. So maybe there's some symbolism here that I'm just not getting. But anyway, let's hear the man speak. It's been three weeks since she last spoke. The vague consumed her so subtly. Seems like only yesterday she was so full of life. Where did this wretched epidemic come from? How long has it been spreading? It was more like a rumor. Something to call people who were bored with their lives. The vague. It was so easy to ignore. But now I see it. Now I care. When I look into her eyes or hold her hand, I feel myself rummaging through a hopeless room, wandering through my heart, desperately looking for something to help her. Each thought seems more dull and vain than the last. The doctors are of no help. They have no idea what it is, where it came from, how it spreads, nothing. Someone has to know something. Each day that drifts by seems like a vacuum, drinking the color from my life. Have I got the vague? How long until I'm just like her? Esther. I love you. I'm heading to work, darling. I'll be back soon. Wow, the voice actor really put some emotion and some feeling into his performance. It felt real sarcastic of me to say that. Well, the voice actor is actually one of the brothers who made this game. And his performance is, well, monotone throughout. I guess Alum's just a level-headed, non-emotional kind of guy. And speaking just from a technical standpoint, the voice acting is very uneven in this game. And I'm not talking about the audio quality. From a technical standpoint, the audio's great. There are some games that I have played where the voice actors sound like they're speaking through tin cans. Alum isn't one of those games, but Alum's problems have more to do with the performances of the voice actors rather than the audio quality. Some characters, the voice acting's great. There's emotion, there's feeling, there's, well, a sense of acting. For others, not so much. But when you take a look at the credits, it begins to make sense because you'll notice a lot of the voice actors share the same last name. So, it looks like the brothers who made this game got their friends and family to help do the voice acting. Yeah, this is an indie game. They couldn't afford professional voice actors. And it does bring down the game a little bit, but I can live with it. It is not the worst voice acting I've ever heard, but it's certainly uh, 
uneven. Voice acting aside, let's talk about the game itself now that we're actually in it. Alum appears to be set in what is a steampunk universe, a universe that's so steampunk in fact, we got steam shooting out of pipes from the moment we walk outside. This is the tutorial section for the most part. Alum here has to find his badge and go to work. And yeah, he doesn't like whoever he works for or with. The game's not very clear. But either way, after you find the badge, you give it to your, I guess, co-worker, boss guy, and then the plot kicks off. Yup, it's you. I've got one delivery for Miss Harkham at apartment 121, sector 44. That's just down those steps. You're practically there. Tell her I said hi. <laughs> <laughs> What was that? Hello? What's this? Why looky here, what a coinky dink. Someone knows of a cure for the vague. Now it's still pretty vague what the vague is, but now we vaguely know that there's a vague cure for the vague. Hooray! But first, Alum has to do his job because after all, he's a working man. So you deliver the package to the old lady, but unfortunately, it's not as simple as just leaving the package at her front door. In fact, when you do that, this happens. I'll just leave their package on the doorstep. Oops. Well, oh dear, isn't that just unfortunate for our hero? Now, if only someone had had the foresight to put some sort of guardrail or something there, this tragedy would have never happened. But seriously, this place doesn't seem very handicap accessible at all. No banisters, no ramps. What's a poor disabled person to do in this universe? Accessibility aside, we gotta find that package and... And oh look, here it is, it's skewered on top of this statue of the city's leader, an eventual big bad. Now, you think it'd be a simple matter of climbing on top of the statue and pulling it off? Oh wait, no! Please, keep off the statue. It's for observational purposes only. Thank you. Now you may be thinking to yourself, because of Alum's rather emotionless, monotone exterior, that he's a pretty passive dude, and will find some sort of clever, non-violent way to solve this problem. But no, you'd be wrong. Deep down inside of Alum is a pretty hardcore badass dude that will not let anything or anybody get in his way. So, how does he get down the package from the statue, you ask? Why, he destroys the robot that's preventing him from doing so. Yeah, he's a hardcore dude, as I said. So, in order to do this, Alum engages in some petty vandalism of this bit of machinery that, for all we know, is a vital part of the city's infrastructure. Well, it's apparently important enough that every time Alum throws a pipe in it, the Ebot comes by and attempts to repair the damage. And fortunately for Alum, too, this dude in the lower right part of the screen apparently doesn't care about his shenanigans. So, while the robot's repairing the machinery, Alum can go to the statue, and no, he can't climb on top of it because the Ebot will teleport back to the screen and wag its little robot fingers and say, no, you can't climb on top of it. Again, no passive measures for Alum. So while the robot's distracted, Alum takes off a bit of the statue. It's kind of interesting, too, that the robots do not care about Alum removing bits of the statue, but they do care about him climbing on top of it. So, now armed with his murder weapon, Alum once again throws a pipe into the machinery yes again yeah the robot doesn't seem to think it's unusual at all that the same pipe is ending up in the same bit of machinery two times in a row now I guess Ebots aren't the cleverest of creations. Nevertheless, while the Ebot is yet again repairing the same bit of machinery, Alum climbs above it and throws down the bowling ball shaped bit of statue, which completely and utterly destroys the Ebot. Now with his foe vanquished, Alum can now successfully remove the package from the statue and deliver the oh so slightly skewered contents of it to the old lady. Hopefully she had insurance. And while you're engaging in your destruction of the Ebot, you get a nice little meanwhile that introduces you to the protagonist's antagonist, the Big Bad. Oh, thank you, Mr. Glim. Thank you. The Lurids would have eaten my son alive. Your Ebot saved him. No need to thank me. I'm only doing what anyone in my position of authority should do. Care for the people. You're the best leader our city has ever had. I'm completely in your debt. Yeah, that uneven voice acting is pretty self-evident in this scene. 
But this guy, Mr. Glim, he's the big bad. And he's also the ruler of the city. I don't know if he's the mayor, the king, the president, or something. But he's the guy who runs this city, just called Cosmos. I don't know if I've mentioned that. And also, he's really cheesed off about this group called the Rogations, who are against his rule. Now, the game never explains why this group is called the Rogations. But I know Google Foo, so I googled the name. And I found out about something called Rogation Days. And they are days that are for prayer and fasting and western christianity i have never heard of such things before but i'm assuming that's where they got their name from it couldn't be a coincidence or maybe it is i don't know i didn't write this game but i should also point out that our big bad here is not the only big bad in this game no there's another one a dark shadowy figure that's about to speak right now your strength is admirable my friend Cosmos needs me. Yes, yes, they do. Well, isn't that just too spooky to handle? Whew. Well, let's collect ourselves and carry on in the game. So, Alan delivers the package to the old lady, and it goes off without a hitch. And for his efforts, he's tipped nine coins, which apparently is a pretty bad tip because he bitches about it to Podge later on. I fought tooth and nail to get that old windbag her package. She only tipped me nine coins. Yeah, I don't know anything about the currency in this game. But what I do know is that we need that money to enter the arcade. Because in case you forgot, the dude named D, who knows the cure for the vague, is apparently there. But the problem is, we cannot enter the arcade without having ten coins because this guy won't let us in. So where's that other coin, you ask? Why, it's on top of this roof. So what do we do? We break into a building and grab it. Then we get to go to the arcade. Simple, easy peasy. So now that we're inside this arcade, the game prompts us to save for some reason. So while the game's saving, let's take this moment to think about the technology levels on display here. At first, the game appears to be steampunky. There's steam. There's robots that have what appears to be chimneys on them. But now that we're in this arcade, it looks like we're in the 80s. These are proper 80s-style arcade cabinets with, like, wall outlets and everything. So it's kind of anachronistic, it seems, almost, with the technology displayed here. We got steampunk robots in 80s arcades. What an interesting universe this is. So sure enough, Alan asks everyone if they're D, and naturally no one fesses up to it. It's just not that easy. However, there is a strange girl in the arcade. I know, a girl in the arcade. What a bizarre place to find one. So, Alan shows her his note that he found on the ground. And sure enough, she's the contact. Hey, where'd you get that? Who are you? What's this all about? Hush, hush, are, are you Saw? No, are you D? I didn't think you were Saw. D described him differently. How'd you get that note? I found it in an alley. Do you have a cure for the vague? Shh! Are you trying to get us vaporized? Keep it down! Oh, why, yes indeed, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between. She is a member of the Rogations. And also, it's apparently a crime punishable by death in this universe to speak about a cure for the vague. Who knew? We are learning so much today. And we're also learning that the Rogations are kind of terrible at being a terrorist organization. Just think about what she's doing right here. Just, just put yourself in her shoes, in fact. Okay, you're a member of a group that the authorities want to destroy. And you're weighing around to meet with a guy called Saul. He's really late. So late, in fact, that your leader, who was supposed to meet with him, has disappeared back into the catacombs of the city. Out of fear, I guess, that someone may recognize him. So you're still waiting around. And eventually, Alum shows up. He does not match Saul's description at all. However, he has Saul's note. Now... He comes to you with the story that his wife has the vague and he's desperate to find a cure. And also bear in mind, apparently talking about a cure, just talking about a cure for the vague will get you killed. So you instantly buy his story wholesale. You don't bother to vet him at all or try to figure out if anything he's saying is true. You just accept it at face value. And you know what you do? You don't ask him to wait. No, no, no. You tell him exactly where your leader is, and better yet, you don't even bother to inform your leader that Alum is showing up. It's crazy. I mean, just think about it. Any competent police organization would have taken out these rogation suckers, like, the same day they set up. They're terrible at being a terrorist group. Oh, Satan, save me. These people are terrible at their jobs. But nevertheless, Alum now knows 
where their leader is. So he has to meet with him. I'm trying to hold back my laughter because this is really absurd the more and more I think about it. This is how the Rogations do their business. How are they still around? Oh yeah, and after you leave the arcade, Alum gets attacked by a shadow monster. But fortunately for him, an Ebot shows up and saves his life. Kind of makes Alan seem more like a jackass for destroying that innocent Eba that was just trying to repair a machine that he damaged. But nevertheless, our hero has to get into the sewer now. So how does he do that? Why? He talks to this guy who's hanging outside of his house. Hi, sir. How are you doing today? Hey there, fella. I'm doing all right. Just enjoying my day off. It's nice to be out of those sewers for a change. Wow, isn't that great? Turns out this guy is a sewer worker. And better yet, he needs Alum's help. Because it turns out, he lost his ID. I know, ID must be very important in Cosmos. But nevertheless, Alum knows where it's at. It's down in the arcade. He picks it up. He gives it to the sewer worker. And the sewer worker, in turn, gives him the keys to the sewer. If you ever need anything, let me know. Actually, I noticed you worked in the sewers. Is there any way I could borrow the entrance key? For you, no problem. You know, I'm pretty sure if I helped out a sewer worker in my city, he wouldn't give me free reign over the sewers. But whatever, this guy doesn't care. Who knows what he's smoking in that pipe. But nevertheless, Alum now has the keys to the sewer. But, of course, it's not that easy. Yeah, he can open the sewer gate, but oh no, he can't pull up the lever to... I guess open the manhole cover? Oh dear, what's Alum to do now? Why solve another puzzle, of course, in a kind of bizarre convoluted way that, to be honest with you, did not seem very intuitive to me. But hey, whatever. This is what you gotta do. It's kind of funny, actually. All right, this is what you need to do. You need to ask the attendant what the cheapest prize is in the arcade. And then while he's gone, you... Well, unplug an arcade machine that a kid's playing on. Yeah, that drives the kid away. And then you have to ask the guy again what the cheapest prize is and then you plug the cord back in and yeah then you get to play the arcade cabinet you know why you need to play the arcade cabinet well you need to win those two balloons to help you hold up the lever duh but you actually need to play the arcade cabinet i kid you not it's a little mini game it's not particularly great and kind of weird like you have to move this dude to the other side of the screen without dying yeah, I don't know about it. Something about this is a little off-putting to me. But either way, after you beat the minigame or just give up, the game will actually let you skip over it if you don't want to do it. You turn in your tokens and you get your balloons, and then you fill up the balloons with steam, and lo and behold, they defy gravity and hold up the lever for you. And then you get to meet the hero of the resistance. You must be D. It depends on who's asking. My name is Alum Descry. Please. You've got to help me. My wife has the vague. How did you find us? I found Saul's letter in an alley, and Sophie said you could help me. Hmm. Nothing is by chance. The Ultras must be propelling this. Again, these guys are supposed to be some sort of clandestine terrorist organization that is a threat to the city's leadership. And they are the most trusted people ever. They take everything Alan's saying at face value. They're like, oh, the altruist doesn't let anything happen to chance. Does nobody lie in this city or something? It doesn't make any sense to me. Again, how could the Rogations have survived for so long with such lax security measures? My name is Dashu. I'm the Rogations leader. Rogations? That's not important right now. Our time is limited. Do you have the cure? There's a lot to say. Please pay attention. Mr. Glim is not what he appears to be. The people of Cosmos are in terrible danger. The Vague has already infected 100% of the population. What? Everyone? Yes. Even you, my friend. It's only a matter of time before everyone is swallowed by the heart void it produces. It's only a matter of time before everyone is swallowed by the heart void it produces. <laughs> so I guess that's why the vague is a threat. It creates a heart void. It's, I'm not really buying that the vague is a sinister threat. Apparently, it's infected 100% of the population, and as far as I can tell, everyone seems to be getting on all right. So it must not be too terrible. Shh. Did you hear that? Run! 
Oh my god, does the city of Cosmos employ Scorpion or something? The dude just got dragged over by a lasso. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, this is a dramatic moment. Yeah, Alum has to flee. He's a code red citizen. The Ebots want to kill him now. It's all pretty terrible. Whew. Fortunately, though, if he hides behind this bush, the Ebots won't see him. Yeah. <laughs> oh god. Yeah, eventually he flees up to where he works, and well. Finds a rope there, and this happens. And Alan falls to his death, leaving behind a lovely splatter right in front of the city walls. Of course not. He survives completely unscathed, thanks to some unrealistic, completely random thing that happened. Woohoo. You know, Alan does bring up a bunch of completely legitimate points there. Who are the Rogations? Why is he a threat to the city now just for coming in contact with them? But anyway, this brief moment of self-reflection will not last because more Ebots are showing up. So Alum here must flee into the land of Tide, which is just basically a wilderness snowy tundra without, well, any appropriate equipment. So uh, things aren't looking good for Alum, are they? <laughs> Alan, this guy, no longer in the tracking ring. He's of no worry to us. If the fall was not his end, then the land of Tide will swallow him in ice. Besides, we finally got that rat, Dashu. It was only a matter of time. The Rogations, ha! Ah. Without their leader, their vision will surely fade. Let's go have a word with our new friend. And so ends chapter one of Alum. This also, by coincidence, was a demo for the game. So, there you go. You just watched someone play through the demo. Now you're going to watch me do the rest of the game. Chapter by chapter. And oh boy. <laughs> the next one is where things get interesting. Yeah. Alum takes a very, well, unique turn to say the least. And I'll see you next time, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between.